What you see on the board, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Probably the most well-known verse out of the Bible. Probably the most often quoted verse in the Bible. Giving is at the heart of the gospel. That's the good news. God gave. We portray our heroes as those who have given everything they have, their life. We give gifts to others for their birthdays, their wedding, the birth of a child, graduation, their lifetime of service for Christmas, and many other times and events we give gifts. We also give to charities to help support whatever their mission happens to be. We give food to the hungry. We give blood to the injured. Parents give up a part of themselves to raise a child. Children give up a part of themselves to take care of aging parents. Giving is not only at the heart of the gospel, but it is also at the heart of who we are as humans. Those who deny that part of their humanity are seen as worse than Mr. Scrooge in Charles Dickens' uh, Christmas Carol. We may have become so jaded by being asked to give that bah, humbug, is our true feeling, just like Scrooge. Whenever we're asked to contribute, that may be our feelings. Whenever the subject of giving is mentioned, people tend to tighten up, to figuratively grab their wallet, to make sure it is secure in their grasp. Now, if you're one of those hearing me today, I ask that you loosen up just a little bit and hear me out. We heard of Jesus talking about giving in today's gospel reading, where he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Now, this verse seems to indicate that there is a certain obligation that we may have in the realm of giving. None of us feels as if we are giving when we pay our taxes, do we? We're not giving it, we're paying it. We feel the sense of obligation. It is that sense of obligation which also shows up when we are asked to give. And I understand that response. We now live in a world where beggars can come at us at any time from any quarter regardless. It is not something that is limited to only our encounter with people on the streets as it was in the days of Jesus. In fact, my experience is that far more begging is done on expensive letterhead than with ten cups anymore. As we receive in the mail this constant barrage asking for money for this, that, and the other thing. And now with the ubiquity of the internet, it is rare to encounter someone who's not trying to get into your wallet for some reason or another, either to sell you something or begging for money. I woke up this morning with three beggars after me on the internet. Now while we are at the effect of all this begging, while it may indeed cause us to close up, let us not lose sight about the truth of giving. It's easy to move to the other extreme and just get so tight that we don't give. We are to give to God the things that are God's. So let me ask a question. What belongs to God? If you said everything, you get an A+. Plus. Okay. Everything belongs to God. God doesn't need anything, as we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 26. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. God doesn't need anything, but we do. And one of the things we need is to give. That is a need within us that many of us don't recognize and don't respond to. All of nature teaches us that giving is necessary to sustaining life. The Dead Sea is dead because it only receives and nothing flows out of it. It gives nothing. 
Now, giving comes in many forms, and I know that everyone sitting before me today, all of you are givers, I know that. So I'm not bringing this up out of some perceived uh, need on my part or a lack on your part. It is simply something of which we should be aware. And for right now, I'm speaking specifically about money. Many of us already freely give of our time, our energy, our skills, but when it comes to the dollar, freely may not be the operative word. Often the giving of our money feels about equal to our giving of taxes. It's a drudgery, but it must be done. Now if that is the feeling, then that is the first thing we need to let go of in order to change. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now in this section, Paul was writing about the ministry of giving. Now notice how he touches on the two negative feelings that most of us have to deal with, reluctance and compulsion. We're reluctant to give because we feel compelled to. When those feelings arise, we tighten our grip on our wallet. In that place, have you really done any good with your giving? The Talmud, which is a collection of main Jewish teaching over the centuries, says, he gives little who gives much with a frown. He gives much who gives little with a smile. God loves a cheerful giver. It's not about the size of your gift. It's about the size of your heart when you're giving. And that is the basis of the saying, it's the thought that counts. That's where we get that from. The idea of giving has been a part of Christianity since its inception. The early church was supported by the gifts of the believers. We read in Acts chapter 2 and verse 45, <clears throat> And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now many have used this as the pattern for the church today, but that is not accurate nor is it the reason we're told about it. It is just the way they were doing things in that day. Communal living is great. I've been a part of communes before, but it is fraught with a multitude of problems, some of which began to show up in the early church. The American church, at least, has been taught to tithe in order to support the many causes of the church. Now the word tithe from the Bible means a tenth or 10%. Tithing is taught as an obligation for the Christian who is a true believer. It has been taught so long and so frequently that most believers think it is a mandate from God upon which our salvation depends. Preachers will take the text from our gospel reading about giving to God the things that belong to God, and they'll say the tithe belongs to God. And after saying that, they leave the New Testament never to return again in their, in their sermon. Why? Because all the scriptures about tithing are contained exclusively in the Old Testament. The word tithe itself shows up in only two places in the New Testament, both of which are telling the same story about Jesus and the Pharisees. The plural form tithes shows up five times in the New Testament. Once in Luke about the young man bragging about his spirituality, and four times in Hebrews chapter 7 talking about the Old Testament law of tithing. The word tithing never shows up in the New Testament and only once in the Old Testament. Neither Paul nor any other New Testament writers ever mention the concept of tithing. Now, 
If it were of such paramount importance for the church, don't you think it should have been mentioned at least once by someone? We have a multitude of verses by the different writers about how the church is to function, the things it should do and be involved in. We even have verses about how to support the activities of the church. But we never have a single thought about paying our tithes. In fact, we are told that the law of the tithe was changed in Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 12 we read, For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. Now this verse in Hebrews 7 is in the chapter that I mentioned earlier where the plural form tithes was used four times. There has been a change in the priesthood through Jesus. Now the argument of this writer is that the tithe belonged to the Levitical priesthood. It did. That was established in the Old Testament. The tithe went to the Levites. But Jesus came through the tribe of Judah, not Levi. Yes, Jesus is our high priest, but not from the tribe of Levi. He came through the tribe of Judah. Therefore, the logic of the author is that the entire law changed in Jesus. I don't know any other way to say it, church. Tithing is not an obligation for the church. It's not an obligation for Christians. Then someone will ask, then how is the church to be supported? The answer is simple. Giving. Recall our verse about giving. Each one must give as he had decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now this verse is in the context of a discussion about supporting the church and the work of the church. That's what it's about. Simply put, tithing only deals with the head. The tithe is 10%. All you have to do is figure out 10% and plop it in the plate. Giving has to do with the heart. Each one of you must decide what is appropriate for you. Only you and God knows the size of your heart in the gifts you give. As Americans under the capitalist system, capitalistic economy, we think of buying and selling. That's what we go by. And we only pay what something is worth to us or whatever price is established. We don't look, we don't tend to take time to what it reveals. Your gift honors God, obviously. It honors the value of the ministry. And it shows respect for yourself when you give. I think I've, I know I've told in the Bible study, I don't know if I've told you here, but when I was teaching yoga, I had to rent a building to teach that class. And I did it on donations. And the donations were not enough. Even though there was plenty of people, many would put a dollar in for the two hours that I was with them. They didn't look at the time I was giving or what they were getting. They looked around and said, oh, he doesn't need that much money. And they put a dollar in. That's not valuing the ministry, it's, and it's certainly not um, showing a respect for what you are getting. We value things ourselves. What is it worth to me, not anything else? You reveal your heart, because only you and God knows the size of your heart in the gifts that you give. The freedom of giving is one of the freedoms we have been given when we were released from the law into the glorious liberty of the children of God. The law demanded the tithe. There are churches today that we know of that demand the tithe and you get um, disciplined if you don't. Now there are more verses in the Bible about the benefits of giving 
than there are about tithing. For instance, in Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 24, we read, One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. People don't understand that principle. We saw it in our study in the Minor Prophets where the, the Lord said, look at what's going on. You earn money and it goes into a bag with holes in it. He's talking about inflation. No, he says, no matter what you got, you don't have enough. This principle works. One gives freely, yet grows richer. It's like he's giving it away. It's told, I believe, of... Uh, Mr. Latourneau, I don't know his first name, but I think he was the founder of the Caterpillar uh, heavy equipment operation. He gave 90% of his income, lived on 10%. Now that's an extreme example, but many of the business magnets of years ago practiced the giving aspect and their businesses succeeded. There's some who practice that. Another proverb says in chapter 19 and verse 17, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he will repay him for his deed. Or we can read in Ecclesiastes, cast your bread upon the waters for you will find it after many days. Essentially, it comes down to you can't outgive God. That's the way I was taught. The words that were used on me. Now finally in the passage I've mentioned about support for the church, we find these thoughts within the context that I hadn't showed you yet. In chapter 9 and verse 6 of 2 Corinthians, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Continually taking, continually receiving without giving is what created the Dead Sea. It's what creates problems in our body if it's dealing with food or lifestyles. We need to be givers. And he continues then in verse 8 and says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. What Paul is saying there is that if you learn to give, not sparingly, God will make sure that you've got what you need for your family, for yourself, for your lifestyle, and for the church. And he continues in verse 10, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Now this verse is used and abused tremendously by the prosperity gospel. And that's not what I'm saying this morning. They talk about sow your seed by sending me $58 or $367 or $1,002. That's not what he's talking about here. But he's saying that God supplies the seed that we need for sowing. And that's something we're spreading out. I have proven these verses to be true in my own life. When the Lord first began dealing with me about giving... He required me to put a $5 bill in my left pocket because that's not where I carry my change. I carry everything in my right pocket. And back then I was carrying my wallet in my hip pocket, right hip pocket. But I had to carry a $5 bill in my left pocket. Now this was in the mid-70s when the minimum wage was $1.60. A 40-hour week produced $64 before taxes. So $5 was a significant amount for a young man with a young family. I had three kids at that time, three babies. I was to have that $5 bill at the ready for whenever the Lord prompted me to give it. More often than not, it went to a complete stranger so there was no opportunity for a favor to be returned. Sometimes, yes, there was a need of somebody in the church. He would direct me there, but more often than not, it was a stranger. 
Now, this was above and beyond what I was supposed to give in support of the church where I belonged. We never went hungry. We never went without the necessities for a young family. My youngest boy, when he was 19 or 20, said, Dad, how did you do it? Because he looked back on what I did, what my annual income was, minuscule. I said, the Lord provides. God supplies. I could tell you story after story after story in my life of God's provision for our needs. I'm going to tell you one. One Sunday, I invited a family over for dinner after service. It wasn't in my, it wasn't, it wasn't our, it was a church I was attending. But I invited a family over. My wife got mad at me. We don't have enough food. Well, I didn't know that. She was going to be embarrassed. Understandably so. In her mind, there was no food in the cupboards. When we got to the house, there were three bags of groceries on the front doorsteps. I have no idea. No idea where it came from. Three bags of groceries for a poor little family still trying to grow. God is good. You cannot outgive God. So when I speak the benediction over you this, this morning, it comes from a place of absolute belief and trust in the one whom we serve. If you're not free with your dollars but still clenched tightly thinking, if I give, I won't have enough left to feed my family. Then I urge you to ask the Lord how you might begin to practice a little more liberally, liberality with your finances. The common statement that you cannot outgive God is supported by both scripture and experience. You can make it your experience by starting small and watching it how it grows. Now this is just another area where we can put our trust in the Lord and his goodness toward us. You can trust the Lord. As many people say, trust me. It's the truth. I believe it. I've experienced it. Amen.